Hello. Uh, today we are continuing our discussion of different concepts in management. And uh, if you remember at the very beginning of the semester, I told you that management implies planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. We've covered planning, organizing, and leading by now. So we're switching our attention to control. And control is a very essential part of the management responsibilities. Uh, it can exist and should exist at multiple uh, levels, if you will. We're going to talk about organizational control, uh, people control, uh, resource control. So we're going to spend some time today um, identifying all of these and uh, seeing how, as a manager, you can organize your work so that all essential parts of the organizational life are properly controlled and you can satisfy uh, whatever expectations your customers may have and lead your company to success. So I will start as usual by sharing my slides. Um, so, um, and I will start uh, by talking about organizational systems control in principle. Right, so what the organization does, it ultimately does for its customers. And the big question is, how should it possibly uh, plan out the process of delivering value to the customer so as to maximize its own performance and maximize the likelihood that it will be there to succeed in the long run? And typically, for most organizations, uh, it starts with uh, preliminary controls, sometimes also called the field forward controls. This is where you try to make sure that uh, you are fully prepared to deal with this process of transformation of inputs in, into outputs. Uh, this is where you try to uh, identify the kind of suppliers you have, the quality control for your inputs. So this is something that comes into your organization, something that you will later on transform into products or services to deliver to your customers. So uh, here you primarily are concerned with the quality of your inputs, with the quality of your workforce, and also possibly with the quality of funding that you get to ensure this transformation of inputs into outputs. And then goes uh, to the transformation process. This is, if you're a manufacturing company, this is when you start transforming inputs into outputs, you know, making a car out of the parts that you've sourced uh, or, or making pizza out of the ingredients that you got. So that kind of stuff. And uh, as you are engaged in the transformation process, you watch the quality all the time, right? As you're transforming inputs into outputs, you are controlling quality. So this is why it's called a concurrent control because the control itself is sort of a part of the transformation process. And the idea here is that uh, if you find some problematic issue, you know, maybe some of the ingredients is not of the quality that you should have, you may try to address the problem be before it becomes uh, a much larger issue. So you've probably heard about the Japanese companies allowing their employees to stop the assembly line if they identify some defective component. Right? So it would seem like it may disrupt the process at the organizational level, but in fact what it does, it, it ensures that uh, the outputs are of high quality and that the problem, if identified, is dealt with immediately. So that's the idea of a concurrent control. Then, once your transformation of inputs into outputs is over, um, you have to check the quality again. It could be that some of the issues have slipped the attention of your employees and that some of the items as a result are defective. So then you'll definitely need to fix them somehow. This is why we call it a rework control. It's typically more expensive than the concurrent control and definitely a lot more expensive than preliminary control but again, it has to be done if you are not to disappoint your customers. And then finally, if, you, um, if you've delivered your products or services to the customer and it turns out that it was defective, that it does not meet their expectations, you have to engage in damage control. This is the costliest one of all. Uh, not only does it cost you money to fix the problem, but it can negatively affect your reputation so for this reason, you see car manufacturers launching uh, recall campaigns all the time because you know it's a lot easier to fix the problem 
than to deal with a situation where a loss of life could have happened. Uh, at all points, when you discover some problems with your products or services, uh, you communicate everything back to the system, so that the feedback process is there, with the idea that uh, if you are aware of the source of problem, you actually have some tools to fix it, to make sure that the problem does not recur later on. And uh, this control, it happens at uh, all levels of, uh, in all functional areas. Uh, for the most part, what we just talked about uh, has to do with operations, right? That's the physical part where you transform inputs into outputs. This is where you engage in this quality control, but it doesn't stop there. So the marketing function of the organization, that's the one that primarily deals with damage control. If something were to go wrong, right? These are the people who would be reaching out to customers and trying to um, find a way to smooth everything out. Uh, human resources, obviously you want to make sure that you hire the right people for the job, that you train them as necessary. So that is an essential part of the control system as well. And finance wise, um, you definitely want to make sure that the funding that you require for the organization is obtained on the most beneficial terms. Right? There are different sources of funding. Of course, the best one is if you can be self-funded or if your customers fund you. But occasionally you may need to raise more funds, maybe to invest in some assets. And where those uh, investments come from uh, is a big deal, really, for the organization. So you want to make sure that financially everything is done the way it should. And that, uh, again, let's be honest, uh, sometimes there are irregularities on how people within the organization spend the resources. So you want to make sure that uh, everything is done the way it should consistent with uh, legal practices, but also consistent with uh, organizational policies. So that is uh, essential. So the control process itself, uh, it has four steps. It typically starts with you setting objectives and standards. Again, remember, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So you've got to put standards in place that would allow you to gauge individual performance, uh, different operations in terms of quality and whatnot. So uh, these again are preliminary controls that you have to put in place before you can really start thinking and working on the uh, following steps uh, of the sequence. Step two, you actually measure performance. This is also considered a preliminary control because here you just uh, gather information to inform your strategic thinking about what needs to be changed, if anything. So uh, with that, you start comparing performance to standards. And this is step three of the control process. So, um, you know, if everything works fine, you may determine that uh, some controls are unnecessary and you may rethink your organizational policies and procedures. Um, it may also suggest that, you know, maybe some of the suppliers are not providing the kind of quality that you expect and that will lead to more controls being put in place, right? New objectives, new standards. So that is uh, essential. And then finally, step four, uh, if you do discover a problem, you have to correct it. So this is where the concurrent control is used. Uh, you may make sure to plan for future corrections. So, uh, you know, you rework to develop uh, some preliminary control, or, or maybe if you already supplied uh, the customer with defective items, you have to engage in some damage control, right? But this all leads to you rethinking uh, the entire control chain so that you learn from your mistakes um, and you make corrections as necessary. And then finally, in that step four, you also try to reinforce standards and objectives, and whatever corrections are needed or not needed, so you have to reevaluate the entire cycle. Speaking about standards, a complete set of standards includes five elements, uh, and they are quantity, quality, time, cost, and behavior. So at the very least, uh, you have to specify the kind of productivity you expect from your employees. Right? If, uh, if you're running a pizza shop, 
there are probably so many pizzas that you expect your employees to, to make per hour. It also has to somehow incorporate the idea of quality. So, um, you know, maybe out of every 50 pizzas that someone makes, one or two may be defective and that's okay. But if that number is exceeded, then definitely uh, some attention is required. Again, it may be that the uh, employee needs to be trained more, or maybe it's quality of your whatever baking equipment or supplies, uh, but something has to be uh, done if the quality is not met. Time is an essential thing as well. It's not enough to say that as an employee, you have to make you know, 50 items during the work day. You have to say that uh, you know, like per hour, your productivity has to be this many items uh, per unit of time. Right, so time is, is an important part of your standards. It wouldn't help you much if some of your employees would be spending extra hours at work trying to get to the productivity level that you establish because it has a number of implications for how the company is run. You have to control the cost. There are multiple ways of doing it. Uh, and for like hourly employees, you can simply specify the salary, maybe sometimes commission, but you also have to watch your other costs, uh, such as inputs. And uh, you know, sometimes uh, for some companies, if they are energy intensive, then maybe you wanna run the whole thing during the off hours when energy is cheaper for industrial companies. So some things of that nature have to make their way into your standards as you develop them for the company. And then finally, um, and we actually rarely talk about it, uh, you have to set standards for behavior, right? So here we talk about people dressing up professionally, treating the customers with dignity and respect, uh, you know, not engaging in some behaviors that could be perceived uh, poorly by customers and that would negatively affect the morale of your other employees. So behavior also has to be specified and um, these five constitute the kind of organizational standards that you want to establish if you want your company to run successfully. In terms of frequency and methods of control. So first of all, uh, we distinguish between constant control, periodic control, and occasional control. And constant control is something that could be quite costly for the organization. So typically you allow people to self-control, right? So your employees, if they work on the assembly line, they have to make sure that they do it by the book, that the quality of what they do is uh, at your standards or higher. So, uh, and you expect people to consciously try to do their best at all times. If there's a problem, it has to be fixed, it has to be addressed, it has to be communicated back to the management. That's a part of self-control. We also talk about clan control, uh, also known as group control. And what that is, it really has to do more with uh, organizational culture, uh, where we all, as a collective, try to make sure that everything is done according to the rules. Here, you, do, you try to do things the right way, not only because this is in your job description, but because you're part of the organization, you have your colleagues and you don't want to let them down by, by doing something incorrectly. And uh, as a part of the collective, if you see someone is not doing, performing the operation the way he or she should, you interfere, you try to bring this to that person's attention, you try to help them address the problem. So this is sort of this, this group control, organization, uh, organizational culture kind of control. And finally, you also have standing plans, right? You remember that there are different kinds of plans for the organization and standing plans refer to uh, sort of repeated situations. So for, in many cases, having a policy or having some sort of a guidebook or rule book is very helpful to ensure that people know exactly what's expected of them and it helps them control themselves to make sure that the organization does what it should be doing. In terms of periodic controls, um, several types here as well. Uh, they may include things like regular meetings and reports. 
So uh, as a management department here in the business school, uh, we meet roughly once a month to discuss how things are going, to identify some challenges, to plan ahead. So that helps us all to be on the same page and to make sure that uh, as a unit of the organization, we do things the way uh, that the organization expects us to. Uh, there are also budgets, right? So uh, money is the language of business and um, all of our activities find their way onto organizational budgets. And we'll talk about them in more detail later on today. So I will leave it at that. Uh, but with budgets, there also comes a possibility to engage in audits, right? So someone may check whether or not the way the organization performs is actually recorded accurately. This helps us identify if there's a problem and uh, sometimes if there's a theft within the organization or financial misrepresentation or anything like that. So that's financial audit. But then we also do uh, managerial audit, if you will. And uh, this is when uh, someone, some professional looks into our processes of planning and controlling and tries to identify deficiencies uh, in those processes, trying to help the management uh, get the organization on track. So those are periodic controls. And auditing typically happens once a year, but depending on circumstances, could be more or less frequently. And finally, occasional control. Occasional controls may be necessary if there are some unique circumstances that require the organization to, to implement those. Uh, you may just engage in observation, make sure that, uh, you know, things progress the way that you expect. Uh, sometimes if there's a problem, you know, the equipment piece has broken down, so you then engage this exception principle. You normally would not control the organization tightly unless there is a problem. So if there's a mechanical breakdown, you have to control the situation much more tightly than you would otherwise. And finally, sometimes you run some special projects uh, that are not part of your day-to-day -day operations. And when there, there's anything out of ordinary, you want to control it a bit more. So you may request your employees to prepare, prepare a special report, uh, a special reports for those projects. Just, just you know, to be aware of uh, everything that happens. Uh, in that particular instance. And as I said earlier, right, money is the universal language of business. So at some point, all of those control mechanisms have to translate somehow into numbers. And we do that with the budgeting process. Uh, there are three types of budgets that the organization creates, the operating budgets, capital expenditures budgets, and financial budgets. So operating budgets is perhaps the most uh, crude of them all. So here really all that you try to do is you develop the revenue budget and then you develop the expense budgets. The idea is that obviously you want your revenues to exceed your expenses so that there is some profitability left for you to develop and reinvest into the company. Uh, you typically started with uh, developing some sales projections, right? Those budgets are future oriented. It's not necessarily looking back. Uh, so you develop the revenue budget, you develop uh, expense budgets, and later on you will have an opportunity to compare whether or not your plans you're thinking was correct. Uh, capital expenditures budgets is something that uh, is meant to uh, reflect all planned major asset investments. So if you plan on some new equipment to be installed in your business, it has to be reflected on the capital expenditure budgets. So really all long-term assets that you cannot write off during this specific financial year typically make their way onto capital expenditures budget. And um, the thing about it, um, so as an organization, obviously you would like to self-fund everything. With capital expenditures, they often require additional inflow of cash. So you have to also think about where that money will be coming from, either from uh, you know, loans or from issuing that uh, 
like bonds or from raising additional stock from future shareholders, right, this is something that you want to uh, consider very accurately. And then finally, financial budgets. Um, there are three groups of budgets uh, or statements rather uh, that you develop as part of your financial budgeting process, uh, income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow. Income statement is kind of similar uh, to operating budgets. Right here you record all your ex expected uh, inflows of money from your operations and otherwise, um, as well as expenditures. So it basically tells you whether or not you're making money uh, as a business entity. Balance sheet is just a representation of your business, all the assets that it owns and all the debts that it owes to others, as well as founders capital, right? All the assets that you have in a company has to be somehow financed, either through that or with uh, founders equity. So assets would always be equal to your debts plus whatever uh, equity the founders have put into the venture. And then finally, uh, the cash flow statement. This, is, this one is rarely thought about, but it is extremely important, especially for startups. It could be that your business is making money according to the income statement, but because you need to pay your suppliers at uh, certain points in time, because you have to pay your employees on certain dates, and because it may take time for you to collect the money from your buyers, you could find yourself in a position when you are short on cash to make those payments. So even if you are profitable on paper, you may not have the actual cash to make the payments that you must. So uh, thinking about your cash flow is absolutely essential. It is far better for the business to have positive cash flow than to be just profitable according to the income statement, because regardless of how profitable you are, if you do not have the money to make the payments, you can go out of business. So this is something uh, to keep in mind, and uh, I believe you guys will be taking, I have already taken accounting classes that uh, consider those three in much more detail. And um, you know, along with uh, controlling the operations and controlling the money, you also have to control the people. When we talk about managing people, we usually frame it as coaching and not so much control, the idea is that you try to provide motivational feedback to your employees to make sure that they perform the, to the best of their ability to ensure success of your business. And whenever you're faced with a necessity to coach someone, there's a process to follow. Right? You always want to describe current performance. And you know, hopefully everything is according to the plan. Hopefully everybody performs the way they should. If that's the case, you should give praise to that employee. Remember, we talked about the importance of giving praise. Uh, but if there's something that needs to be corrected, you describe the current performance, describe design performance, get a commitment to the change from the person whom you're trying to coach, and necessarily follow up. Uh, it's part of your responsibility as a manager, and it may not necessarily be the most pleasant thing to do, to tell people about their mistakes or about things that should be improved, but that is your responsibility and it has to be done. So it's best if you approach it seriously. Um, one thing that kind of helps with this whole coaching and mentorship agenda is the so-called managing by walking around principle. So uh, you wanna be seen on the floor. Uh, your employees need to see you as a manager. They need to know that you are actively engaged, that you are there to answer their questions and maybe provide some guidance. So this managing by walking around allows you to listen to your employees, allows you to listen to their conversation, right? So to, to basically check the temperature of what's going on uh, on the floor, to teach them if there is something that needs to be taught and then facilitate the change process. So uh, being there, being an active part of the organizational processes is essential if you wanna be an effective manager. 
you may engage in management counseling, which is definitely different from, uh, you know, the psychological, psychiatric counseling. So, uh, but you may try to help people get to where they need to be. You have substantial organizational resources at uh, your convenience to help people uh, to get there. So um, you basically want to be there, you want to be active, you want to be seen as a resource and not just as a uh, watchdog for the organization. And if you do that, then you're more likely to see people actually take their organizational responsibility seriously and trying to help you reach the organizational goals. There will be an there will be time where you need to engage in disciplining the people. Right, so something was done that should not have been done or something has not been done that was absolutely essential. If uh, that is the case, you definitely try to get a one-on-one -on -one with the person who needs the discipline. And uh, assuming this is not the first uh, violation of your expectations, you have to refer to the past feedback. Right? You basically say that, look, an issue like that has been reported we have discussed it before, we have agreed on you doing this and that, why hasn't it been done, right? So you always need to ask why, because it could be that there's some issue completely outside of the employee's control, and uh, you know you need to be aware of that uh, before you give the discipline to the employee. If you determine that it was actually the employee's doing and not some some circumstance outside of the employee control, you have to give the discipline, right? As a manager, again, this is your responsibility. If you do not discipline your employees, then things will not get done as they should. So you give the discipline, you get commitment to change and develop a plan for the change with that employer. And then you summarize everything and uh, establish some follow-up steps uh, to make sure that the issue does not. Uh, happen again. And as a manager, you definitely will be bombarded by all sorts of messages and conversation from your employees. So you want to receive those messages correctly as well. First of all, and we've talked about that when we talk about organizational communication, you have to listen really carefully. You need to pay attention, avoid distractions, uh, stay tuned in, meaning you need to paraphrase every now and then to make sure you're actually there, that you understand the situation as being described accurately. Try not to interrupt. Don't assume too much until that communication is over. Uh, you watch for nonverbal behavior. Right? So this is something that we do not have the luxury of right now with this COVID-19. Uh, but basically when you communicate to others, you get all those ways to scan uh, employee understanding and meaning and whether or not he or she is happy or concerned. So you want to pay attention to that. For that reason, face-to-face -face interviews are, are much better than anything that happens at arm's length. You ask questions, take notes, and convey understanding. Right? If the employee comes to you and, and reports on a problem, he or she needs to, to know that you understood what the issue is. Right? So you have to actively convey that understanding to the person. Then you analyze the thing. Right? You think about the problem. You wait to evaluate the situation until after listening. So you basically want to spend time considering the problem from multiple angles before you decide to do anything. And then you check your under the understanding with the person who delivered the message by paraphrasing and again watching nonverbal behavior. When it comes to discipline, there are several guidelines that you need to keep in mind uh, when planning for effective discipline. So first of all, you have to clearly communicate the standards and standing plans to all employees. And sometimes it's easier said than done. For instance, here in the Herbert Business School, we have all sorts of policies that uh, as employees, as faculty, we may not be ourselves fully aware until the situation happens. Right? This simply is too much. The organization is too big, it's too complex. So uh, it could be a challenge. As a manager, you have to make sure employees are aware of the policies 
they know where to find those and uh, you need to encourage them to actually read those. So uh, there are different ways that that can be done. Uh, in some cases, for instance, uh, this university makes us go through online training and then answer questions and uh, um, with, with possible consequences if we don't do that. So that encourages us the hard way to go through some of the policies that the university deems to be particularly essential. Uh, if you need to discipline the person, you have to be sure that the punishment fits the crime. We don't want to under discipline, but definitely not over discipline as well, right? So the discipline has to be there. Employees have to know that they need to live by those policies and rules. But again, the punishment must fit the crime. If you overreact, that will send the wrong signal to all the employees and some of your best and brightest may decide to look elsewhere. You need to follow the standard plans yourself. It's pretty hard for someone to receive discipline from a person who's been violating the rules. And I guess we all can imagine situations when that happens. So, uh, you know, try to be an example yourself. Uh, you want to take consistent and impartial action when the rules are broken. Meaning, you know, if there are several individuals involved in whatever incident, uh, they all should receive the same kind of discipline, right? You cannot play favorites here. It's, it's essential that you are impartial. You want to discipline people as soon as practical for the violation. You have to stay calm and get all the necessary facts before the discipline, but speed is of the essence here. If you try to punish someone now for an act committed a year ago, it will really not have that same kind of uh, influence and impact that you hope. You try to discipline in private, right? So you give the person an opportunity to, to keep the face with the uh, fellow employees. So that is essential. And you always document the discipline. So we've talked about different ways to communicate feedback to employees. You remember that critical incidents files, so this is where this idea comes into play. You have to document any discipline and action that you have given to some employees, because if the issue keeps recurring and you have to follow through with maybe the firing process, you've got to have everything backed up and available to you to explain if the employee complains that something has not been done according to the you know, standard procedures or whatnot. And importantly, when the discipline is over, you have to resume normal relations with the employer. Again, maybe easier said than done, but uh, in that spirit of impartiality, right, you hate the sin and love the sinner, so to speak. So uh, you want to punish the behavior, but then once the issue is addressed, you simply resume regular relations with that employer. A, uh, Part of your responsibilities as a manager, you know, if you've supplied a defective item or if maybe if service has not been performed as it should have, you're going to be handling customer complaints. And that is an essential part of the organizational control system. So what do you do if you receive customer complaint? If it is genuine, if it, you know, if what the customer is, reports is, has actually happened, the first thing you do is you admit mistake and you apologize, right? So as a manager, the buck stops with you and uh, you have to acknowledge the wrongdoing and apologize and try to make that person feel better about the situation. Then you ask for and agree on a solution. You do not necessarily do everything that the customer wants, but you try to come to some common ground where the issue has been addressed and hopefully you retain the customer for the long run because it's always easier to retain the customer than to win a brand new customer. You need to implement the solution quickly. If this is an issue that could be happening, not to just this customer, but to a great number of other customers, you have to fix your organization processes. If there's one employee that causes trouble, you have to address it with that employee. If it's a supplier, you have to take it to the supplier. And so you do your best to prevent future complaints. Right, you, you listen to the customer, you offer the solution, you implement the solution quickly, and then you try to prevent future complaints. And you're also gonna be getting uh, complaints from your employees. 
That could be about anything, you know, uh, other employees, uh, some of the suppliers, maybe the way that the processes are organized within the company. So again, you start by listening and paraphrasing, making sure that you've understood the notion completely. You ask for a proposed solution, but don't necessarily commit to the proposed solution. You want to gather information so as to increase the number of options you have and not to really limit you to a particular course of action. Then you're gonna seek additional information by talking to other employees involved in the complaint and ideally to your own boss, right? Because your boss may have a different perspective or maybe some experience as to how similar issues have been resolved previously. So you wanna collect that information there and then you plan and implement action and finally follow up. And this, this following up uh, is actually kind of critical because uh, you want to make sure that the issue has truly been addressed and that it will not come to bite you at a later point in a slightly different form. So you want to make sure that, uh, you know, once you've implemented the plan that you've developed, that the issue is taken care of. And that is roughly the basics of organizational control. Uh, I hope you found this uh, useful. And, um, you know, this almost concludes our semester. We have one more chapter to take care of. Uh, we'll do that next week. And um, for now, guys, thank you for your attention. And I'll see you in a week.